So there is yet another uh, demonstration taking place in the centre of London today uh, about Gaza, against mostly against Israel's war against Hamas in the Gaza Strip. There are some uh, geopolitical developments too. So we have the United States not just uh, dropping uh, food aid from their planes over the Gaza Strip in order to alleviate the very serious situation there. But also American-made bombs are being continued to be dropped by Israeli planes onto targets in Gaza with a uh, massive loss of life. We know, for instance, from the Washington Post that despite the public rhetoric of the administration criticizing the government of Prime Minister Netanyahu, the latest batch of military aid has been sent by the US to Israel. Uh, more F-35 fighter jets, thousands more smart bombs, f- uh, um, 500-pound bombs, 2,000-pound bombs. So these are big things that cause a lot of destruction being sent to Israel at the very same time. And, of course, we have Easter coming up. So the usual throng of Christian pilgrims to places like Bethlehem or the old city of Jerusalem to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, that has massively narrowed down. It has virtually disappeared. There is no tourism to Israel at the moment for all the obvious reasons. And yet at the same time, we have this very perilous situation inside the Gaza Strip with various United Nations agencies warning that famine is imminent, especially for the 300,000 Gazans who are still stuck in the north of the Gaza Strip, where Israel isn't sending the amount of aid that has been waiting at the gates of Gaza for, for weeks and months now, isn't allowing the amount of aid in that is necessary to keep those people fed. And it is a very real possibility that we will have man-made famine in the Gaza Strip in the coming weeks? And what would the consequences of that be? Okay, let's talk to Dr. Reverend Dr. Munther Isaac. He's the pastor at the Christmas Evangelical Lutheran Church in Bethlehem. Good morning to you. Uh, good afternoon. Oh, good, good afternoon. I'm you. sorry. It is afternoon where you are. You're two hours ahead. And uh, and, and happy Easter. You're, I'm, I'm, you. I'm assuming that you're writing your sermon or perhaps you've written it already. What's the gist of it going to be in these very difficult times? Well, um, for uh, Good Friday, uh, obviously, we had to look at the cross and the meaning of the cross and the idea of uh, the suffering God, uh, the God who identifies with humanity in its pain and suffering. Um, The idea of Jesus who cries, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A cry that I think the people of Gaza can strongly resonate with. Uh, even the cry, I am thirsty, that Jesus cried on the cross uh, with the famine that is already uh, taking place in Gaza with um, friends to- we talked to telling us they don't have you know, the necessary food or medicine. Uh, these calls on the cross become so uh, relevant uh, at this day. So when you address your congregation, apart from pointing to the suffering, what else are you asking for? We're asking for resilience. Uh, We're encouraging people to be resilient. Um, Again, taking an example from Jesus, who was steadfast, resilient at the cross, who faced death uh, and pain uh, with strong uh, faith. Uh, So we're asking for resilience in the wake of uh, tremendous suffering. Uh, Resilience, not just so that we are tough uh, or survive, but also knowing that... uh, you know, ultimately justice will prevail, uh, truth will prevail. And uh, Easter, uh, again, gives us a very powerful message of the triumph of life, of love, of light over death, uh, darkness, and and hatred. This is the idea behind the resurrection, that Mm. ultimately God has the final word. Uh, And so this is what enables us to be resilient and uh, to hold strong in the midst of the most severe uh, circumstances. I wonder what relevance your spiritual message of resilience has to people who know that they are literally days or maybe hours away from starvation unless those gates to aid are open. So there's some very practical things beyond the spiritual realm that could happen, that should happen, but that are not happening. We're calling for aid to enter. We're begging, we're pleading for aid uh, to enter. Uh, And I think that this war has uh, confirmed to us that at the end of the day, you know, the the idea that uh, there is an international community that cares and international law. And I mean, Israeli leaders told us from day one that there will be no food entering Gaza and they kept their word. And no one is able to uh, make them bring uh, 
uh, even aid. You know, we were calling for a ceasefire the whole time. Now we're only calling for aid to enter Gaza mm. with this desperate and uh, starvation is already kicking in. Uh, but I think that uh, at the end of the day, uh, we lost everything. And speaking to our friends in Gaza, they lost their homes. They lost uh, uh, even after this genocide is over, if they survive, there's nothing to uh, to live in. You know, the, everything is destroyed from schools to hospitals to universities to streets. Mm. Uh, but I think the only thing we cannot lose is our faith. This is the only thing that no one can take away from us. Uh, and uh, the... Uh, steadfastness of the people of Gaza, which stems from their faith, is evident for all to see. And so I've been saying from the beginning of the war, they can take everything away from us, but they can never take uh, our faith. So yes, we will continue to plead and call for uh, a ceasefire Mm -hmm. and aid to enter. uh, But uh, I strongly believe that man shall not live by bread Mm -hmm. alone. And this is when uh, our faith comes so handy in the most severe situations. And as someone who's neither Jewish nor Muslim, you know, as a representative of the relatively small Christian community, both in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, do you feel that you have a particular role to play in this, perhaps a role as a mediator? We're part of the Palestinian people at the end of the day. We're not uh, a community that is in between. Uh, We're going through uh, everything. You identify with one side. Uh, clearly, n- not just because of our national identity, but because of our experience. I mean, our siblings in Gaza right now are going through this genocide. We lost many of the Christian community uh, through bombardment, through shooting, and through the famine and sickness. Uh, similarly, right now, I- I'm speaking to you from Bethlehem. Mm. Uh, I wish I could visit the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Even I, as a pastor, I'm not allowed uh, these days to enter uh, Jerusalem, like the... Uh, so so just how does that work? You need a special permit, don't you, to get into Jerusalem from Bethlehem? All Palestinians, yeah, all Palestinians need a special permit from the Israeli military. And uh, it's not just this year that uh, it's hard to get permits. This year has been uh, the most difficult. Uh, almost no one has the permit. Uh, but uh, in previous years also, it wasn't that easy to get the permit uh, to get uh, into Jerusalem, even when Israel claims that in Easter they make it easier they give a very limited number and the process is complicated oftentimes. Um, it's very painful. It's very painful to be just 20 minutes away from Jerusalem uh, and not be able uh, to go there because of the separation from the wall and the checkpoints. And the last time I was in Bethlehem, which was just a few months ago, I was just struck by the size of the wall separating the communities. I mean, this makes the Berlin Wall look like a garden fence. Uh, the wall has tremendous also psychological effects on us because it, it literally gives the impression that we live in this huge uh, open air prison. Uh, and the idea that right now, uh, if Israel closes two checkpoints, we're also isolated from the rest of the West Bank, not just uh, Jerusalem. So our experience as living within an open air prison is even man- man- mm. magnified with uh, uh, the ugliness of this concrete uh, wall. That, let's not also forget, has confiscated uh, on the other side, on the Israeli side, so much of our land. Mm. And when I say of our land, I'm not just saying a political statement as if this is Palestinian land. I'm talking about land that our families have owned and uh, farmed uh, for generations. And now we no longer have access Mm. to this land. Now, you gave evidence at the International Criminal Court of Justice as part of South Africa's genocide case against Israel. And you mentioned the word genocide in one of your earlier answers. This is something that many Israelis would, of course, disagree with. I just wondered how you, and this may be difficult for you to answer as as a pastor, but how do you think Israel should have responded to the killing of 1,200 mainly civilians on the 7th of October? What should Israel's military response to that have been? Well, to begin with, its political leader should have resigned for leading us into this catastrophe, mm. for leading us into this mess, because we Prime said Minister for Netanyahu. generations. Yes, of course, and, and, and everyone in his cabin, but especially Netanyahu, because they've led us into this. Uh, and uh, I have been warning, so did, uh, so had many, many other religious leaders that we are on the brink of disaster because the current status quo is mm. not sustainable. And I'm going to say the same about the West Bank. What's but hang on a minute, just, just to press you on this question, even if they were negligent, and there are many Israelis who would agree with you on that one, even if they were grossly negligent you know, in taking their eye off the ball and allowing this to happen, ultimately it was Hamas 
in an Islamic jihad, they were responsible for uh, the slaughter of 1,200, the killing of 1,200 mostly civilians, you know, in their living rooms, in their bunkers, in their homes. How would, should Israel have responded to that? Well, uh, as a pastor, I don't think war uh, or violence uh, does ever solve anything. Uh, and our region can give a clear example of this. Nothing uh, ever worked through military uh, advancement. Um, uh, my only suggestion forward is the international law to be implemented. Uh, people have been asking me this question, how do we get rid of Hamas? And I say, get rid of the occupation, mm. we get rid of Hamas. And the idea that Gaza was not occupied before October 7th is ridiculous. Mm. Gaza was under a very, very severe uh, siege. So let's solve the problem from uh, its roots and not just uh, tackle and isolate one incident at a time. And and, and don't get me wrong, uh, October 7th, of course, uh, was horrifying. I don't uh, condone or justify violence, but we've been saying for years now, look at the problem from its root causes mm. and don't isolate sure. one incident alone as if that is uh, the problem. As someone uh, who lives in, in Bethlehem and, you know, and you've been watching both communities you know, existing side by side, you know, in a very, in a very um, vexatious way for many, many years now. Do you think that there is any hope at all for the two-state solution in your part of the world? A, a solution that, you know, the governments of Britain and the United States and indeed Germany and France and, and many, you know, Middle Eastern governments still say they believe in. Do you think that is actual any possibility of that happening? Uh, right now, it doesn't look like it. I mean, Israel, under the watch of these very same countries that you mentioned, uh, have killed the two-state solution uh, through its massive uh, building of settlements. Even during this war, they have advanced the building of uh, uh, settlements. Um, and so I, I can never take the UK seriously when their leaders say we call for the two-state solution, knowing that they've done nothing. They've never held Israel accountable for the building of uh, settlements. And I think the question of the one state or two states ultimately should go back to Israel and its allies. They colonize the land, they establish a state on someone else's land by forcibly uh, expelling mm. back then in 1948, 800,000 people. So now we're left with, to me, very simple options. You either accept dividing the land uh, or mm. you allow Palestinians to be part of uh, this one state that you created. I don't see any other option other than the uh, unstable and uh, always possibly exploding current status mm. quo. Uh, and so Israel and its allies, those who helped create Israel, those are the ones who must give answer to this question. And certainly right now, it doesn't look like uh, we're anything close mm -hmm. uh, to a two-state given the advancement of these settlements.